Hola, bienvenidos al servicio en español de la Iglesia de Cristo en Pine Tree. I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. We're, uh, welcome, we're, we're happy to have you here with us today. All right, this is Juan Garcia, in case you've never met him or you don't know who he is, Juan, tell him who you are. Yes, my name is Juan Garcia, I'm the Hispanic minister here at Pine Tree. Uh, excited to say hi to everyone, and uh, believe me, I'm anxious to see everyone here as well. All right, thanks Juan for joining us. I just saw Juan and I was about to film this welcome, so I told him he should join so you could see his face because I know you miss him. And I want to welcome everybody today. Thanks for joining us for our online worship. Uh, we're going to have some songs that Tony Griffiths is leading us in. Matt Wicks is going to lead us in communion. You'll hear from uh, Ken Hounsel, one of our elders later on, and I will lead us in our sermon. So thanks for being here. Prepare yourself, eliminate your distractions, and we hope to see you soon. I will worship. shall read. 
turn in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. Oh, praise the name of the Good morning, church. Um, as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper this morning, uh, or this afternoon, or this evening, depending upon uh, when you are are watching, um, I'd like to read a quick verse uh, or two from the Gospel of Mark, uh, chapter 15, verses 9 through 15. Uh, and this is what it says. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate, knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. But why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him! Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. As I was reading through this text, um, I looked up what the 
what the meaning of the name uh, Barabbas means. Uh, it literally means Bar Abbas, which means son of the father, which I find quite interesting uh, given the fact that Jesus, uh, who is the son of God, is about to die uh, for, for this man, Barabbas, whose name means son of the father. I'm curious to know, uh, what was Barabbas's reaction uh, when he realized that he was pardoned? Uh, was he relieved? Uh, was he appreciative? Did he feel like he got off the hook? Uh, did he feel like he got out of a tight, uh, tight scrape uh, and he escaped the jaws of, of death? Uh, was he repentant? Uh, we really don't know. Um, but one thing's uh, for sure is that for Barabbas to, to be set free, someone had to take his place, and that was the custom during the Passover uh, to allow uh, one prisoner uh, to be set free. Uh, if we read really quickly in John 11, verse uh, 49 and 50, it says, Then one of them, named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up, saying, You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. And Caiaphas right here is prophesying and he's saying that it would be better for Jesus uh, to, to die uh, instead of the entire nation of Israel perishing. Uh, some scholars surmise that Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, uh, may have even spoke with Pilate, uh, telling him that if Jesus were to be released uh, and set free, uh, that his followers and Jesus himself might even start an insurrection right there in Jerusalem. Uh, the whole irony of that is that Pilate is convinced to release a known insurrectionist, this Barabbas uh, man, in an effort uh, to possibly prevent an insurrection uh, from even occurring. Um, but what I love about the Barabbas character uh, is that, that Jesus was literally willing to die for Barabbas. Uh, that in order for Barabbas to be set free, uh, someone had to take his place. But the same is true for me and you. In order for us to be free from sin, uh, someone had to take my place. Uh, we all are like Barabbas. We all have made mistakes. We all have sinned. And we all uh, deserve punishment. Uh, but isn't it a blessing that we serve a God who is loving, a God who is merciful, a God who is willing uh, to provide that sacrifice for us. We needed a substitute and a savior, uh, just like Barabbas uh, did, and we should all praise God that Jesus Christ is that substitute. So let's think about that uh, as we uh, partake of the Lord's Supper. Let's pray. Dear God, we come before you, we thank you for the day, and we just pray as we take uh, this bread, that we would just remember the sacrifice that your son Jesus made on our behalf. That yes, he died uh, for Barabbas, but he also died for me and for, for all of the sins of everyone on earth. And we are grateful for that sacrifice, and we thank you uh, for his willingness to do that. Help us to remember that at this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, let's say another prayer as we partake of the fruit of the vine. Dear God, we come before you again, thanking you for the blood of Jesus that cleanses us of our sins. I pray that as we take this cup that we might remember the love and the sacrifice and the mercy shown on our behalf 
at the cross. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial to him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. To him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. Oh, that with yonder sacred throne we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and praise Him, Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and praise Him, Lord of all. If you have a Bible handy, Turn to Galatians chapter 6. That's going to be our, our main text for this morning. And I always think that you're going to get more out of it if you follow along in a copy of the text, whether you're using a device or using a copy of the Bible like I have right here. Uh, I've been in this sermon series. This will now be the sixth and probably the final week talking about what I've called it people problems. Dr. Alan Godwin wrote in his book that relationships fulfill us the most but they can also hurt us the most. Another way of explaining this or understanding this is that we, we have a desire as human beings to belong, to be accepted by others, to have true, genuine friendships, to be understood by others. You know, that's how God created us and wired us, but at the same time, we know that that longing within us opens us up to potentially be hurt. John Ortberg calls this the porcupine dance. And he said the human beings are kind of like porcupines in this. You know, porcupines have their quills and they can poke you. So if a porcupine wanted to get close to another porcupine, they could do that. But if they feel like they're in danger or threatened and they pop those quills out and then they poke each other, well, then they run away to in, in order to avoid being hurt. And human relationships are a lot like that. We get close, but then we stick our quills out and we hurt each other and then we back off. We get close, we back off, and that's what he calls this relational dance. And maybe you can relate to that. We've, we've probably all been like that. We get close to people and then we wind up getting hurt, get our feelings hurt, whatever it may be, and then we back off. Well, Galatians chapter 6 is where I'm kind of landing this plane for this sermon series. And the reason I'm focusing on Galatians 6 is, for one, I think that God may have something to say to us today through this text. And also because Galatians chapter 6 has been on my heart and on my mind really since around the holidays, around Christmas or New Year's, I was experiencing some of my own people problems. And one day I opened up my Bible and I read Galatians 6, 1 through 10, and I found it to be very helpful but also very challenging to check my own motives. And before we read Galatians 6, 1 through 10, I want to give you just a quick background uh, on the book of Galatians and really a lot of Paul's letters in the New Testament. Paul is writing to churches that are experiencing people problems. There's Jewish Christians from a Jewish background trying to learn how to be a part of a church with Gentile Christians from a completely different background. And especially in this letter here, this church that Paul's writing to, 
the Jewish Christians believe that the uh, Gentile Christians need to uh, follow the law of Moses, get circumcised, and do all the things that the Jewish Christians would do. And so Paul is writing to address these problems and these issues. And we're basically skipping over all of the theology and all of that, and we're just jumping right to the application part of the text. And instead of me reading it, one of our students from the Pine Tree Church is going to read it for us, so I, I want you to follow along with them. And I also want to give a shout out to Landon Vineyard, who read our text last week, uh, but I, I didn't get a chance to refilm my sermon, so I didn't get a chance to put him put his name in that. So thank you, Landon, last week, and now this week, Grant Beakley is going to read our text for us. So follow along with Grant as he reads. Today's scripture reading is going to be from Galatians 6, 1 through 10. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are some, something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone, without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. All right, thank you, Grant, for reading that text for us. Now you've heard it, all 10 verses, and what I want to do is just walk through it slowly and go verse by verse and talk about a few things as we go along. In verse 1 of Galatians chapter 6, it sounds a lot like what we talked about last week, which was Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 through 17, where Jesus says if somebody has sinned or sinned against you, you go talk to that person. Well, here, the Apostle Paul says, brothers or sisters, I'm reading from an NIV this week, a New International Version. Paul writes, if someone is caught in a sin. Okay, let's stop right there. If somebody's caught in a sin, uh, I think what Paul means by that, you know, the word that's used there can also be translated as overtaken by a sin. And if you were to go back to Galatians chapter 5, Paul lists uh, what he would consider the fruit of the Spirit, but he also talks about the acts of of the sinful nature. Maybe it's one of these sins that Paul lists in Galatians 5. Maybe it's one of the overall problems that the, the burdens that the Jewish Christians were laying on the Gentile Christians. He's not real specific by what he means. He just means if somebody's caught in a sin or overtaken by a sin, I'm assuming that's somebody living intentionally in sin. He says, you who are spiritual, uh, you, those who live by the Spirit, should restore that person gently. So we're called to help restore. We have a responsibility in this. But to really understand what Paul's saying here, we have to have an understanding of this word, restore. Uh, the Greek word that's used that Paul uses here, restore, uh, it means something along the lines of to, re, uh, to bring it back to its former condition. And a commentator named Warren Worsby says that this word for restore, this Greek word, is actually a medical word which could also be used to reset a broken bone. When I was in third grade, I was driving back with my, driving home with my parents one day and I saw some of the neighborhood kids outside playing football. So I told my parents, stop the car, I'm gonna go out and play with them. And of course, we were playing tackle football with really no supervision and I was one of the younger kids playing and most of the other kids were much older and bigger than me. And I remember at one point I had the ball, I was running and one of the older, bigger kids came to tackle me when he tackled me, he tackled me right into a tree. And, and I think I fell onto a tree root. I closed my eyes for a second, and I opened my eyes, and I was in a lot of pain. And my arm was broken, my right arm right here. Uh, I broke both bones, the radius and the ulna. It was, it was drooping. It was actually very disgusting. I can't even look at broken bones anymore without getting queasy. So they ran home real quick, got my parents. My parents took me to the emergency room, and with our luck, you know, the emergency room was really busy that night, so I remember having to sit with these two broken bones just waiting on the doctor. 
And finally, when they brought us back to a room, they did the x-rays, they did everything they were supposed to do, and the doctor came in, and I'll never forget this, he told me to stick my lip out. I was like, why? He said, just do it, stick your lip out. So I stuck my lip out, and as I did that, he reset both of my bones. Uh, he didn't give me a warning that he was going to do it, and he was pretty aggressive with it, and it hurt really bad. In fact, him resetting my bones hurt probably as bad as it did when I actually broke my arm. So the word that Paul uses in Galatians 6 and verse 1 to restore is kind of rooted in this medical terminology of resetting a bone. And, and Paul says to restore that person, probably not like my doctor did, just grabbing those bones and, and putting it back in place and setting it very aggressively. Instead, Paul says to restore someone who's caught in a sin with a spirit of gentleness, or to do it gently. So why should we do this in a spirit of gentleness? Well, for one, we need to remember that we're all sinners. And so when we approach somebody, a brother or sister in Christ, from our church family that's caught in a sin, we should do it with humility knowing that whatever sin that that person's caught in, that could be us if we're not careful. So we do it not out of arrogance, not out of pride, but we're called to restore people with a gentle spirit. Do it lovingly. And then Paul goes on at the end of this verse to say, but watch out, watch yourself, or you may also be tempted. And what I think Paul's alluding to here is... Even though we have a responsibility to try to help others, we also have a responsibility to take care of ourselves. I'm going to say more about that at the end of this lesson, but I want to move on now to verse 2. Paul writes, Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Carry each other's burdens. What does that mean, and what does that look like? Some of you may remember Robbie Goldman. He was here at Pine Tree in September, I think, of 2018-ish, around there, he came and preached one Sunday morning. And I've known Robbie for a long time. He works at Dry Bones Denver in Denver, Colorado. And I heard him tell the story in a sermon one time, and I actually texted him this morning for permission to share this, and he said, go for it. But he told the story about this young girl who was 13 years old, and her mom died of cancer. So both this girl and her dad we're, we're grieving deeply as only we could imagine. And the dad made a decision after a little while to try to move on as best they can. And he didn't want to be reminded constantly of the pain of the fact that they had lost, he had lost his wife and their daughter had lost a mom. So he made a decision to have some garage sales. And he was going to sell away a lot of her stuff to try to move on. Well, this little girl was 13 years old at the time that happened. Fast forward many years later, and she's getting married. She's now a young woman. And she has, she lives in Texas, so she has several bridal showers. And for the very first shower that she has, a lady that she had grown up going to church with showed up with this gift. And it was an oddly shaped gift, the way it was wrapped and everything. And when she got to that gift, she opened it up, and she recognized right away what it was. It was this big milk jug. It was kind of a brownish, rusty-looking milk jug. And it wasn't just any milk jug, but this girl remembered that that was her mom's milk jug. And at that bridal shower, and in every bridal shower she had before she got married, some of the ladies from her church had brought her gifts that had belonged to her mom. You see, when this girl was 13 years old, uh, and her dad was selling things in the garage sale, the ladies from church knew that they had a burden to carry that they could not carry alone. So these ladies from church showed up at the garage sale and they bought these items and kept them intentionally with the plan of giving them back to this girl someday when she was ready for it. And Robbie told the story and he said he knows the story really well because it's his wife, Karen. She was that little girl. So they were there at that bridal shower when she was given these gifts. And to me, that is a powerful example of what Paul means by carry each other's burdens. Sometimes we go through tragedies and we go through deep pain and, and major problems in our life. And, and sometimes we have burdens that we just cannot carry on our own. And thank God that he has given us the church, a church family to be a part of so that we don't have to carry these burdens alone. And that's what these ladies did for Karen 
was they knew that her and her dad were not in an emotional place to carry this burden alone, so they made sure they kept all of her mom's items for later on in life. So Paul says, carry each other's burdens, and in doing so, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Well, you might have to go back and read the whole letter of Galatians to understand what maybe Paul means by that, why he's using this language. Probably, more than likely, the law of Christ is not a new law, but it's the law of love. It's the law that is a little bit different than the law of Moses, and Paul's been talking about the freedom that they now experience in Christ, but I won't spend too much time in that. I want to move on to verse 3 of Galatians 6. And in verse 3, Paul kind of switches gears from our responsibility to others, and he switches gears to our responsibility to our, ourselves for just a minute. In verse 3, he says, If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. That's just kind of a short verse that stings a little bit. If we think we're something and we're really not, we're just deceiving ourselves. We're not fooling anybody else. We're fooling ourselves. This is a verse where Paul is basically saying it's not about you. In uh, Romans chapter 12 and verse 3, in the middle of that verse, Paul writes these words, Do not think of yourselves more, high, more highly than you ought to. And I, that's what I think of when I read Galatians chapter 6, verse 3. Don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought to. Be humble. And in verse 4, we'll move on to verse 4. It says, uh, Paul writes, Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to anyone else. So usually when I preach through a text, I spend a lot of time the week before or a few weeks before just kind of reading through it and being with the text. And verse 4 is one of those verses. There's a word in verse 4 that really jumped out and grabbed my attention. But I'll start with the first part of this verse where he says, each one should test their own actions. Another way of putting this is each person should examine themselves. If you were to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse Five, Paul writes, examine yourself to see whether or not you're in the faith. So basically, Paul is just calling all believers, instead of looking to other people, to look within yourself and examine yourself, test your own actions. And then in verse 4 of Galatians 6, he says, without comparing yourself to someone else. That word comparing is what really got me. It may be translated different in different English translations, but from the NIV, Paul says, you know, you're not supposed to compare yourself to other people. You test your own actions. Now, the reason that caught my attention is because over these last few months, while we've been in social isolation and, we, you know, social distancing and shelter at home, and we haven't been able to come to church at the church building, so we're offering first live stream services and then online church and then online ministries, online Bible classes or small groups or whatever it may be. I, and I'm speaking from my own experience here. Is it a great challenge for a lot of ministers right now, and, and maybe some of you in other professions, is to struggle with the comparison game. It's hard not to think and to even hear sometimes, well, look at what this other church is doing. Look at how they're doing their live stream. Look at how they're doing their online worship. Look at what that preacher is doing, or, or so on and so forth. And I think it's okay to, to pay attention to what others are doing and to learn from them because we all... We all mimic each other in a way, and we've done a lot of that, learning from other churches. But at the same time, if we spend a lot of our time unnecessarily comparing ourselves to other people or other churches or whatever profession you may be in or your social life, if you're spending a lot of time comparing yourself to someone else, Satan can use that to really get us down and to cause us even more pain. So Paul says here in verse 4 to test our own actions and not compare ourselves to someone else. And then we'll move on to verse 5 where Paul writes these words. For each one should carry their own load. All right. This is where I have a question. Because to me, it just an initial reading of this, it seems like verse 5 is contradicting verse 2. Because in verse 2, Paul says, carry each other's burdens. And now in verse 5, he says, no, each person should carry their own load. So which one is it? Do we carry each other's burdens or do we carry our own load? Well, one way of understanding this comes from this book. I'll show it to you. It's called Boundaries. Maybe some of you have read it. It was written by 
Dr. Henry Cloud and Dr. John Townsend. And it's a great book. And if you're struggling with people problems, you want to learn more about boundaries, I would recommend that book. And in one of their introductory uh, chapters, they talk about this chapter here, Galatians chapter 6, and the difference between verse 2 and verse 5 and how we can understand it. And they say the difference is the Greek word that's used for burden in verse 2 and the Greek word that's used for load in verse 5. The Greek word in verse 2, when Paul says carry each other's burdens, means uh, an excessive burden. Almost like a, a boulder or a weight that somebody cannot carry by themselves. So when you've been, and, and you could be crushed by it, so when you've experienced crisis or tragedy or whatever it may be in your, your own life, those are burdens that you're not meant to carry on your own. Kind of like the story I shared earlier from Robbie and Karen Golden. Um, so that's what the Greek word means in verse 2. But in verse 5, when Paul says each person should carry their own load, it's a different word. And they say that it means cargo. It's kind of like carrying around a knapsack or a backpack. We don't expect somebody else to carry around our backpack. We're, we're required to carry our own backpack. So there are some things, some loads, some daily tasks that we were meant to carry on our own. So, for example, I'm responsible for my own yard. I don't expect somebody else to just look at my yard and say, well, I'm going to go take care of that for them. No, I'm responsible to mow my own lawn. I'm responsible to take care of my kids. I'm responsible to take care of my own health. I'm responsible to make sure I'm going to bed at night and getting enough sleep. I'm responsible for those things. Other people aren't responsible to make me do those things. So I have certain responsibilities that are my own load to carry. And, and that's different than what Paul means in verse 2 where he says, carry each other's burdens, which is like a boulder. And I'm going to say more about that in just a minute when, as I begin to wrap this up. In verse 6, in verse 6 through 10, really, uh, most scholars believe that Paul is talking about money. He's talking about uh, giving some sort of compensation to the spiritual teachers. And N.T. Wright says that Paul manages in verse 6 through 10 to talk about money and giving and taking care of the teachers without actually using the word money. So I won't spend too much time on verse 6 or 7, but in verse uh, around 7 and 8, he talks about sowing and reaping, which probably means uh, you, you reap what you sow spiritually in the sense that if you if you don't provide for those who are ministering to you, well, then you're going to reap what you sow. But there's also a wider meaning to this also, and that's there's, you know, the, if you sow to the, the Spirit, you're going to reap eternal life. If you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap destruction. All right, And we could spend a lot of time talking about that, but hopefully you, you get the idea of what Paul's saying. I'm going to move on to verse 9, because in verse 9, uh, this is another one of those verses that really reached out and grabbed me when I was reading through it this week. Paul writes this, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. The word weary is what really stood out to me here. Um, again, one of the ways to understand this is to just try to define what that word is. So the Greek word for weary means something like exhaustion, to grow weak, to grow weary, to be tired, or to become faint-hearted. Um, have I don't know if maybe this word resonates with you, but have any of you experienced some weariness during this stay-at-home time? Anybody feel weary or, or worn out uh, to the point of exhaustion? I, I've heard a lot of people say, and I've, I've experienced this some myself, as we've experienced some Zoom fatigue uh, for church stuff, for connect groups, but also for work life, for meetings, or whatever it may be. We've been on Zoom a lot, and some of us have become weary of doing that. We need a little break from it. Some of us all of a sudden became teachers at home. We had to learn how to do homeschool. I know that my wife is right there, and, and that can cause somebody to become weary. Or maybe your job situation has changed some, and you've had to learn how to work from home or your financial situation has changed. There's so many things that have gone on over the last two months that can cause us to become weary. So when I read this in verse 9, this resonated with me because I've felt weary. And I don't think what Paul is saying right here in verse 9 is, is that if you felt any sort of weariness, you've sinned, you're in the wrong. But what Paul is 
encouraging us and encouraging this church to do is to not grow weary in doing good. Don't, don't let life wear you out to the point or the comparison game to wear you out to the point where you're not effective for the kingdom of God anymore. Instead, Paul says, just keep pressing forward and don't grow weary in doing good because if you, if you continue to do that, uh, you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. And then in verse 10, he wraps it up by basically uh, just kind of one final thought or challenge. He says, therefore, as we have opportunity... Let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Let us do good to all people. Uh, I like how Paul caps it off with this statement here, um, that we're not just focused on ourselves, we have an outward focus to do good to others, starting with our own church family, family of believers, but also to the entire world. And if you were to read the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38, we're told that's what Jesus did. He went around doing good. So as we read through these 10 verses, and I've been going through this sermon series called People Problems, there's a really good chance if you paid attention, not just to what I said in my explanation of the verse, but if you paid attention to what the Word of God is saying, there's a good chance that God may be speaking to you and maybe convicting you of some area in your life. Maybe one of these verses uh, really stood out to you and stuck with you. And so you may have already come up with some sort of application to apply to your own life. But as I was reading through this, there's kind of one final thought that I have. And I think it relates to this people problems discussion. And it, again, it comes from this book uh, that I've already mentioned, Boundaries. But they say in the book that we are responsible to others. And we're also responsible for ourselves. We're responsible to others. And we're also responsible for ourselves. And if you look back over everything we just read, we have a responsibility to go to our brother and sister in Christ and try to help restore them. We have a, a responsibility to help carry each other's burdens. We have a responsibility to do good to others. We have a responsibility to share with each other. We have a responsibility to one another. Um, whether or not people cause us problems or not, Jesus has called us to love all people, even our enemies, and we have a responsibility to others. Now, at the same time, though, we're responsible for ourselves. So we're responsible to examine ourselves, to test our own actions. Uh, we're responsible for uh, when we try to help restore someone to make sure that we don't become tempted in the process. That's back to verse 1. Uh, we're responsible to take care of our own soul and not compare ourselves to everybody else. We're responsible... Uh, to carry our own load. We help others carry their burdens, but we have our own daily tasks that we're responsible for. We're probably always going to experience people problems in our life. That's inevitable. But understanding our responsibility, that we're, responsibility, we're responsible to others, but we're not responsible for others. What we are responsible for is ourselves. Now, I, I read through Galatians 6, verse 1 through 10, and I also think about the gospel. I think about Jesus and how this relates to this gospel message. And you look at verse one and Paul writes about restoring somebody who's caught in a sin. And then I think, how does God restore us? How did God restore us because of our own sin? He did it through the cross. He restored us by dying on a cross for us. In verse two, when, when Paul says to carry each other's burdens, how does God display that for us? Well, he carried our burdens with him on the cross. And, and we always like to share with you each week that if there's anybody out there watching this, if you've never come into a relationship with Christ um, and you are interested in having a further discussion about baptism and what that would look like for you, uh, or you're ready to be baptized in Christ, please reach out to us and continue to stay in touch with each other. And Lord willing, we will be together soon and, and slowly come back together. And I'm really looking forward to that day. And I hope that everybody has a great week and that you will glorify God and think about some of these words that we've talked about this morning. Just as I am without one plea, but that Bye.
Good morning, church. I'm Ken Hounsell, one of the elders here at Pine Tree Church of Christ. We're glad you're here. Glad you're meeting with us uh, via the Facebook, YouTube, whatever it might be. We look forward to the day that we can be together. And right now, that looks to be June the 7th. And uh, the ministers, the deacons, elders, and staff, we're all preparing for that day. And we'll give you more details as we know more. But right now, June the 7th, that's two Sundays from now. Uh, you can get more information on the website, pinetreechurch.org. Also, if you have a, a need or a question, you can uh, email L. Venable, that's Laurie Venable, L. Venable at pinetreechurch.org. Or if you have something more pressing or more private for the elders, you can reach us at elders at pinetreechurch.org. Uh, there again, Facebook and YouTube, and we're glad you're here this morning. Um, if you've been following along in Proverbs, as we're reading through Proverbs this month, you've run across Proverbs 12, 25, 15, 23, and 15, 4. That caught my attention. Their studies show that it takes five encouraging words to make up for one discouraging word or an insult. Uh, I always thought it was more than that, but I'll take five. Well, this addresses that a little bit. Uh, 25, Proverbs 12, 25, it says, Anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. In 15, 23, 
the NIV says, a person finds joy in giving an apt reply, and how good is a timely word? And then down in in 15.4, in the NIV, it says, the soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. I encourage you this week to be part of the five that encourage and to avoid being the one that requires five to overcome you. We look forward to seeing you on June the 7th, and we pray that that day comes quickly. If you'll pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day and the blessings you've given us and for allowing us to be together uh, through social media. Um, this week helps to go out to encourage others to know that this time will pass and that we'll be together soon and to love each other and to be children that, that sh show your light. We thank you for your son who died on the cross for our sins, and we look forward to the day that we can be with you. In his name we pray, amen. Have a good week.